All right, now mowing. This is one of my favorite things to do. I like it too because that's the one time that I can't hear my phone ring. I'm by myself. Not many people approach you while you're on a lawnmower because you have violent spinning blades right around you. So it's kind of a solitude thing and it's instant gratification. As soon as you're done, you can look at it and you can say, look what I've done. Look how good it looks now. So it is, it is a fun thing to do. And regardless if you like turf or not, it's the one thing you are going to do, you know. Especially you live in the city, the ordinance are going to make keep your lawn cut to a shirt, certain height and not get out of control. So everybody's going to do it. We're going to kind of go over a little bit about mowing. Um, there's actually two types of mowers, believe it or not. We use what's called rotary mowers. There's more expensive mowers called real mowers. It's not an actual real mower. It's a real R-E-E-L. Um, and it actually cuts the leaf. So what it has is it has a bed knife and then it has these spinning reels, okay? So then it grabs the leaf and physically cuts it because there's two blades. There's one on the bottom and then there's another one on that reel as it spins and cuts it. We don't really cut grass with the rotary mower. We're just spinning that blade so fast, it just chops it off real quick. It's more like a sword action than it is than a scissor action. That's why it's important to keep a healthy or a sharp mower blade and a well-equipped mower that's running really well because it's gonna help the health of your turf too. So we got two different types of mowers. These are gonna mow from about one inch and up. These will mow one inch and down. Since we don't mow our lawns less than an inch anyways, we don't really need them. These are really expensive. Real mowers are. They have them now where they got computers on them, where they are telling them how fast to spin. If you're turning, it's going to slow down the inside reel and it's going to speed up the outside reel so it all cuts uniform and even. They got, I mean, you can get up to $50,000, $55,000 when it comes to these mowers. Yeah, I'm going to take my $9.99 special here to mow my lawn. So anyways, there's a lot, there's, there's different types of mowers out there. Just want, want you guys to be, be aware of it. Now these probably won't go above three and a half inches. Why is that? Safety. You don't want to get your feet, your toes up underneath it. When you get three and a half inches, the probability of a toe going up underneath it is a lot higher than it is um, whenever it's set a little bit lower. So clippings. The rule is, if you remove your clippings off your lawn, you have to add 25% more to your fertility program to equal the same response as if you would have just left them on your lawn. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the fourth, fifth, and sixth most abundant elements in a plant. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are the first three. So you have free fertilizer that's getting applied back to the lawn. So if it's already there, might as well use it. If we don't, we gotta add more fertilizer to achieve that same response with it. Now I say it doesn't contribute to thatch. Zoysia grass is a question mark. We haven't really figured out what there is, but in zoysia grass, there is a direct relation with clippings and thatch and all other turf grass species, it doesn't contribute to thatch. So don't worry about that. Thatch is just that weird thing that we'll get to and we'll talk about in aerating um, and seeding here in a minute. So, mower, you decide discharge, you mulch it. If you do collect it, you can use it in other areas of your garden, you know, because it is free fertilizer. You can use it as mulch. Um, it'll help shade out weeds. So it is a good, a good practice to keep the clippings on your lawn. Now, how high do you cut the grass? Remember when I told you about these numbers, okay? Does anybody know if their lawnmower can cut two and three quarters of an inch? All right. Your lawnmower is different than my lawnmower that's different than your lawnmower. Mine actually says A, B, C, D, and E. Okay. So I had to look at the manual to see how high it's actually mowing. Um, on a lawnmower, if you take it out and you're like, well, I want to see the actual height that I'm cutting. If you go out and you put it on concrete and you measure from the edge of the deck to the ground, is that a good way of doing it or a bad way? Bad. Why is that? The blade is up underneath it for safety purposes, right? So the best way to figure out how high you're mowing, just go mow 
and measure how high the grass is. You know, it is way too easy. Now you can get the manual and you know look up. That's that's what I started with. I looked to see what setting C was, and C was three inches, so I just mow it on setting C in my lawn. So when I talk about Kentucky bluegrass going two to three and a half tall fescue, two and three quarters to three and three quarters, that's because someone did a controlled experiment and found out at different fractions of an inch. Cool season grasses, three inches. That's a good two and a half, three inches. I personally, I like three inches better because weeds are gonna be the most thing that you fight and three inches really helps out with your weed control compared to two inches or two and a half inches. So. Cool season grass is three inches. Bermuda grass and zoysia, one to two inches. I really, for a home lawn, two inches. Even if your mower can mow at one inch, you're gonna scout the ever living crap out of that ground, right? Who's got a level yard? I don't. So when the lower you go, the more potential you have for that blade to hitting the soil. So two inches, you're gonna have a healthy looking turf grass. It's gonna help out compete weeds and you're not gonna worry about scalping as much. Uh, buffalo grass, two to three inches or it's a no mow, quote unquote. If you have the back 40 that you don't wanna mow but once a year, buffalo grass is gonna grow up and it's just gonna kinda of hang out there and maybe just mow it one time, you know? Um, like I said, I would just mow the lawn and then see how high it is is the easiest way to determine how high you're mowing and what setting you're setting on with that. So, height of cut, real important. Because you mow your grass, um, I'll tell a quick story. You wanna keep these in these ranges because that's gonna produce a healthy turf. When you start getting really low, and we'll see this in the weed control section, you're gonna have way more crabgrass and fescue if you mow it lower than if you do if you mow it higher. So my little story, so when I was starting my little lawn mowing business and I was playing baseball, I used my grandparents' lawn as advertisement because they lived on the other side of the farm next to the street. So I could take their yard, I striped it up really nice, finally got it mowing. Well, my grandfather loved to mow that sucker down to the ground. I mean, he mowed and mowed, it was like a dust bowl every time he mowed. He was always on it. He had a really good crop of moss and not much turf in there. So one Sunday, my dad woke me up. And uh, one, oh, let me back up. One other weekend, I went to play in a baseball tournament. Okay. My grandmother called my mother and said, you better get Jared over here to mow this lawn. Dale's out there. He's getting ready to get the lawnmower out. and He's going to scalp it down. He's going to ruin everything that Jared spent all the time doing it. But sure enough, he did. Took me a long time to get that yard back into shape because all the weeds kept coming in. It killed a lot of the turf that was there. But one Sunday, my dad woke me up. He said, come on, we get, meet me over there at the shed at the, on the other side of the farm. I was like, we're gonna be late. Mama's gonna have us if we don't get to church on time. And he said, don't worry, just come on. I get over there, he's got the truck, the generator, and a welder. I'm like, what are we doing? He said, this will be the last time this yard ever gets scalped again. <laughs> that setting got welded at three inches, and my grandfather never knew it took his entire life. He mowed and mowed and mowed. Now I figured out it wasn't about the grass. I think he was just wanting to get out of the house and get away from grandmother for a little while. Because it wasn't about the grass, because he didn't care. He just mowed and mowed and mowed. So. That's, my, that's the one true experience I've had about mowing height than really, really messing up a lawn. So mow it at the correct height, but also make sure that you, um, you have sharp mower blades. We're not talking fillet knives, but keep a good edge on it. The idea is about every 10 hours. So if you have a dull mower blade, you're gonna have this rip, more of a ripping and a tearing effect than you do if you have a sharp mower blade. It's just like me falling and getting a huge strawberry on my arm. That is a huge surface area now that my body has to take energy from to repair that wound. Same thing in turf. Now, if I just cut a little cut, my body doesn't have to use as much energy to repair that wound, just like in turf grass. If you have a clean, sharp mower blade, you get a clean cut. 
And so you have less energy going into repairing that, more energy going into producing new leaves, producing rhizomes, seeds, or whatever, and growth. So also, just like me having a big bruise on my arm or a big scab on my arm, I have a higher percentage of getting infection because there's a surf, larger surface area there, and turf is the same way. They can get diseases and they can get infected, and that is just the front door wide open for disease to enter into the plant. So make sure you have a healthy or a well-equipped mower, change the oil. I like right now is you know, a good time to change the oil or right before you put it up for the year. Change the oil, put a new blade on it. I like having two blades. Um, so put the new one on, take the dull one to get, to get sharpened while I'm using the good one and just kind of flip flop them back and forth. The mower blades are not that expensive, so getting two of them will really save the life of them. So keep a good sharp blade. Now the last thing about mowing, how often you mow it, okay? Who mows once a week? Twice a week? The least as possible. <laughs> All right, we got you, I hear you. Well, what we've tried, or what the research has looked at is, this is called the one-third rule. You never want to remove more than one third of the leaf at a time, okay? That's because I found out if you remove more than that, then the plant's a little bit more injured, it gets stunted. So this is the optimal amount that you can remove without really hurting that turf grass plant. And because it's gonna keep growing, you just keep removing the one third. All right, if you mowed at one third, According to this rule, and say you wanted to maintain your lawn at, we'll say, two inches, and then say you want to maintain your lawn at four inches, which one do you have to mow more often? Two inches? Yes? Four inches? No. Nope. Same amount. According to this rule. All right, so who says two inches? Four inches? I'm confusing the heck out of y'all, ain't I? <laughs> and the same amount. All right, now tell me this. If you maintain your grass at two inches or four inches, which one's growing faster? Four, two, they're both the same grass. So they're both gonna grow at the same speed regardless if you cut one at two inches or if you maintain one at four inches. So according to this rule, if you wanted to maintain it two inches, you let it grow to three inches, all right? If you want to maintain it four, you can let it grow to, but if it grows the same speed, say a half an inch a day, you got to mow the one at two inches every two days, and then the one at six inches every four days, because you can allow more growth to be on top before you cut it. So on golf courses, they mow the golf greens every single morning, because they're taking just a fraction of that leaf blade off, and they can't afford to take any more than a third. So that's why they mow every day, I know people go on vacation, people get sick. This is a guideline. It's not a strict method of going out there. Um, but if you do try to stick to roughly the one third, then you will, you will have a healthier lawn. All right. Who knew mowing was so much fun? <laughs> Who knew there was so much science just behind mowing grass too, right? So, all right. Any questions about mowing? The question was, does it matter which time of year, how high you let your lawn grow or you maintain it at? All right, there's a yes and no to that. I would say you can adjust it inside of these parameters, but I wouldn't come outside of those parameters. You know, uh, right now in the winter time, people like to say, well, I'm gonna let it grow tall and then that way it blankets it and then so it looks better in the winter. Really, if it gets too tall, it lays over and flattens and becomes mats, and you could get diseases, you can get all sorts of things. Right now, too, with cool season grasses, we are seeding, airifying. We really gotta get that seed down to the soil, so you might wanna mow it just a little bit lower to ensure that seed gets down to the soil or that you airify um, is a little bit more effective. But if you stay within that realm, you do better. So. That's, my, that's my, my idea of it. These are optimum. You can stay at this all year or you can stay at this all year. I keep mine the same year round. I don't, I don't change it just because I don't want to have to think about it, okay? 
Did I raise it up? Did I lower it? I can't remember what I did type of thing. All right. Fertilizing. That's what's next. This is where I lose people. Because <laughs> there's numbers involved. <laughs> We're going to try and keep it super, super simple. Okay. First thing when it comes to fertilizing, what do you do? Get a soil test. Yes. Always do it. Do it once a year if you want to on your lawn. Do it every other year. But I like once a year before you get ready to do your fall fertilization for cool season, right before spring if you're fertilizing warm season. Do it before so you know how much you need to put down. If you don't need to add it, don't add it. Because every time the number in the bag goes up, every time there's more numbers in the bag, the more money's coming out of your pocket to pay for it. So if you don't need it, don't add it. So what is in the bag? What do these three numbers represent? Phosphorus and potassium. Yeah. But what is that number? Percentages. Exactly. So you can have a 20-pound bag or a 50-pound bag, but it could be both 24% nitrogen. Okay, quiz. Ready? If I had a 100-pound bag of this analysis, how many pounds of nitrogen do we have? 24, exactly. If now I had a 50-pound bag of, of this, how many pounds of nitrogen do I have in that bag? 12. All right, done. Geniuses. <laughs> That's all I wanted you guys to know because your fertilizer is going to be different than your fertilizer, than yours and yours and yours. Regardless of where you get it, what you get, it's going to be different numbers. So what we're going to talk about from now on is actually the amount of nitrogen itself or phosphorus or potassium, not the amount of fertilizer. You know what I'm saying? So then you can take that number and apply it to what fertilizer that you want to buy at that time. Got it? Yeah. All right. That's usually where I lose people. Y'all are like in the 99th percentile here. <laughs> We're doing good. That's right. All right. So the first number is nitrogen. It's the most important one when it comes to turf grass health. Nitrogen moves all different ways in the soil and the atmosphere, and so it's readily available and readily used, readily gone, faster than anything else. So phosphorus and potassium, they typically stick around a lot longer depending on your pH and things, and typically your soils have plenty of them. So this is the one that's going to cause your green color and your growth. Okay? This is the one you base all your fertilizer off of. If you do a soil test and you get it back, who's, anybody done one this year? Soil test? Yep. Did it tell you to add nitrogen? Yeah. Yep. Every time. It's off the recommendation of how much nitrogen the fertilizer needs. It never really tested nitrogen in the soil because it knows it's rapidly taking up and moving and going on. Short-lived. So nitrogen is the most important green color, rapid growth. Now here's some more scientific words for you. Quick and slow, all right? We have quick release fertilizers and slow release nitrogen fertilizers. Quick release means it's released quickly into the system and available right then and there. It doesn't last very long, only lasts a couple weeks. So if you apply this type of product, you might have to do a couple applications to give it fertility over the span of period or time that you want to give it to. Slow release. It's a slower response, but it's controlled. So it could last a few months. And these are sulfur-coated ureas, IBDUMs. There's all these different types of them. But the easiest way to remember, it's going to tell you one on the bag if it contains X percentage of slow-release sulfur-coated urea or something like that. The easiest way to explain the difference between slow and qu quick, I think of it's like batter. Like how much batter you put on something. So it's the same fertilizer. One is just maybe coated. And so say a slow release has 25% that has no coat on it, 25% that has a thin coat, 25% that has a little bit thicker, 
and then 25% that has a super thick coat. So you would apply this product out there. 25% had no coat readily available right then and there for it. By the time that's gone, that second coat with a thin coat is worn off and now it's available to the plant. And then by the time that's worn off, then it stair steps up through it. So then you get a longer release of that same fertilizer. It's important because if you, sometimes if you wanna put three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet, but you only wanna do it one time, slow release may be the best. Because say you want three pounds over three months or something. You can get a slow release, maybe 120 day, but at one time and it's gonna release over the entire three months. Where a quick release is only gonna last a short period of time. So, real scientific, quick and slow. Next nutrient is phosphorus. If you don't need it, don't add it, okay? Most of the soils in Kansas have adequate phosphorus. Phosphorus helps with seeding and sodding, so you sometimes you see that number a little bit higher when it comes to starter fertilizer, and that's okay to add that if you are seeding or if you're sodding. Phosphorus doesn't move a lot in the soil. So if we're seeding and we're sodding, where are the roots at? Very top. Or our soil test is giving you the average of however deep that you did it, right? So when we're seeding and we're sodding, if we add a starter fertilizer that has a little bit of phosphorus in it, we're putting that phosphorus right there at that soil surface where those little bitty roots are. And so then it helps with root development and then it's able to grow down into where there is more phosphorus in the soil. Because phosphorus does not move in the soil. It's not like nitrogen, doesn't move around. So that's why you see phosphorus added on the uh, starter fertilizer and it helps um, if you keep it on the moderate to low side this will help prevent weeds but if you don't need it don't add it i have seen high phosphorus tend to get more weeds like plantain or wild violet in those areas where actually there's a phosphorus toxicity to turf but then those weeds can grow in it and the turf can't so then you see the the weeds actually growing better than the turf but if you don't need it, don't add it. And then potassium, same thing, don't need it, don't add it. Most of Kansas has adequate uh, potassium. Now, potassium has been related to stress management. Heat, traffic, cold type of thing. So one, one person told me then, well, I'm just gonna go apply a whole bunch of potassium fertilizer and then my grass is gonna be able to survive the summer heat. Not necessarily true. You don't get heat, cold, and traffic tolerance if you're deficient in potassium. If you have enough potassium, you can't go get more heat tolerance, you can't get any more drought tolerant if you add more. Once you hit a maximum level, then you can't get any more benefit from it. So if you're adequate with it, don't add it. But sometimes if you take, if something's just not right, you get a soil test, you see your potassium's low, and maybe why it didn't survive the drought a little bit better. Maybe why it didn't survive the winter as good is because the potassium was a little low. So don't add more if you don't need it. It's kind of the name of the game when it comes to fertilizer. If you get a good fall fertilizer on for cool season grasses, you really don't need it in the spring. You've prepared it for the winter time and then it's already in the plant, ready to rock and roll once it warms up in the spring. If you could do springtime fertilizing of cool season grasses, um, you do spring, we'll come back to this one. If you do springtime fertilizing of cool season grasses, you tend to get a flush of gro growth in the spring. And you get more top growth than root growth. In the springtime, the soils are still cold. So if you applied fertilizer when the soils are still cold, it's not gonna have as much root development. You're gonna have more shoot development, and then you're gonna go into the spring with a compromised short root system. So I like to split this up. I should, write, I should put this as September, October, November. Between September, October, and November for cool season lawns, three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet total, okay? That's over those three months. So September, you went out and say you did a pound of a quick release. October, you may come back and do another pound. November, you may come back and do another pound, and that gives you three pounds. Say you had a three pounds of slow release put out in September. That's gonna give you the maximum of three pounds that you need. Maybe you don't wanna do three pounds. Maybe you only, only wanna do two. 
you come in mid-September and then late October with a pound a piece of a slow release, or maybe just two, or a pound a piece of a quick release, I'm sorry, and maybe you just went with two pounds of a slow release in September that got you all the way through. All right, now this is where I get some glassy ass, all right? <laughs> I thought we had quick and slow down pat, right? So we're looking from October, or September, October, November. That's our prime time. During that prime time, you're looking at one to three pounds, more like two to three pounds over all three of those months. However you wanna put it out of nitrogen. If you wanna do a slow release, then you wanna put all the slow release at the beginning, in September and let it release all the way through November. Say you did a quick release in September, quick release in October, would you do a quick or slow release in November? Quick. Why would you do a quick one in November? It's getting cold and you're wasting money because if it's not growing, it ain't going to soak it up and use it. So then you just fertilize some weeds maybe. So November one is really important. Because what the plant does in November is it takes up that nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and it stores it inside. And so it knows, it knows it's getting cold. It knows it's not going to grow as much. So it knows I'm going to store this in there. And so what it does, it gets through winter. And now that you have the energy stored in the plant, it's not as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. It's as carbohydrates. It's already changed the form of it. But when it gets warm in the spring, it already has carbohydrates stored up inside the plant. And so when Mother Nature says it's warm and ready to go, it's ready to go. It's not waiting on us to feed it for it to then grow at that time. So fall is the most important. March and May, if you don't really need it, if you fall fertilize, you'll know when it gets warmer if you really need to do a spring fertilizer. If you do a spring fertilizer, do not use more than one pound per thousand square feet and use a slow release at that point. If you use a quick release, you've released one pound right there in May, super crazy flush of growth, maybe you have a cold spell, maybe something else happens, but then you get way too much shoot growth, and you get way too much growth on top that leads to diseases, leads to all sorts of other things. So if you do a spring one, only if needed, do a slow release and only do a pound. Yes? The question was, do you recommend any weed and feed? If you are gonna do a weed and feed product to prevent your annual grasses in the summertime, when do you put that on? We'll kind of get this in the weed section, but we'll go ahead and spring, fall, okay? Spring, fall, winter, I love it. This is great. For, yeah, for like the weed and feed for like your crabgrass and stuff, right? That's gonna be in the spring. So your weed and feed, you don't really need a spring fertilizer. So get one that has low numbers on the back. You don't need to fertilize. You want to put the pre-emerge out unless you have to fertilize type of thing. Now, there's other weed and feeds that are like broadleaf weed killer and fertilizers, right? Those, you would probably put a pound of nitrogen out because you're trying to kill the broadleafs right now type of thing. So it depends on which weed and feed that you would use. But if you don't need it, I wouldn't add it. So, all righty. Now take all that, throw it away, because it's the exact opposite when it goes to warm season grasses. Oh, here's a good picture. All right, forgot about this picture. So this lawn on the right, fertilized on Halloween, viewed in December, went on the left, not. All right, February. This one was fertilized in the fall. That one was not. I was telling you about how it can take in that and it holds on to that green color. It stores those carbohydrates. This one's gonna come out as soon as it warms up in the spring a lot better than this one on the left right here. So you're holding on to green color through the winter with fall fertilized cool season grasses for, with that late October, November type timing. Now I did forget one thing, other nutrients, um, these are micronutrients. Definitely get a soil test to determine if you're um, deficient in these. Um, sometimes iron, I see iron deficiency in lawns. It's like the yellowing effect that's going on. It's not really iron that's the problem. It's the pH of your soil. So what's happened is you've moved your pH 
and not let iron become available to the plant. So yeah, short term, you might have to add a little iron to it to get that yellowing out of it, but long term, you need to adjust your pH so then the iron that's already in the soil is available to that plant. Did y'all take soils? All right, so you knew that, right? Sure, I like that as an answer. <laughs> and this, go, this goes with all nutrients. You know, if you get it on the sidewalk, get it off the sidewalk, put it in back into your turf, blow it, sweep it, whatever. If you put iron on your sidewalk, it will spot it and it will make it weird colors. So always to get the stuff off your sidewalk. All right, sorry, I forgot about that slide. I wanted to make sure we, we talked about it. So warm season, it's the exact opposite. I like to break these down into the turf grass species themselves because they require different amounts of fertilizer. So Bermuda grass, it's, a, it's the faster -er growing warm season grass, which means it needs more food. It's like a teenage kid on a growth spurt every year. You gotta feed it a little bit more than maybe zoysia grass or buffalo grass. So Bermuda grass, you're looking at two to three pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year, but it's growing in the summertime. So we wanna feed it June, July, August. That's the time we wanna feed it. Watch out, you don't wanna feed it these winterizer fertilizers for warm season grasses, I don't like them. You feed it when it's growing, not really feed it when it's sleeping type of thing. Zoysia grass, it's a little bit slower growing, doesn't require as much, one to two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet per year. So you're looking at June and July. Um, you could put two pounds with a slow release on in June if you wanted to, and then nothing for the rest of the year. You can put one pound of a quick release in June, and then you can come back with one pound of a quick release in July. Same thing, same idea that we did with the cool season grasses, you just split it up. Now buffalo grass, I have about a pound here. Remember I said a little bit goes a long way. I recommend if you're seeding buffalo grass to put a pound of nitrogen on it, you will get a better establishment, quicker establishment, maybe the next year you might not do anything to it. But during that establishment, the nitrogen really helps with growing that turf in a little bit quicker. Some years, you may put a half a pound on it. If you want just a little green response, put just a little bit of nitrogen. But don't overdo it. Because like we said, you can love buffalo grass to death. And you can love it to death when it comes to fertility too. So one time a year for buffalo grass is really all you need. We did it. We established some buffalo grass in Manhattan. Um, Last year, we put a pound and a half on it when we established it in, and we have done absolutely nothing to it this year. Maybe next year we might put a half a pound or a pound on it, but we didn't have to do anything to it this year. So it's kind of whatever you want to do, but don't overmanage it, don't over maintain. But you will get a lot of good green color, darker green color with buffalo grass with just a little bit of nitrogen. The question was for the cool season grasses. If you used a slow release fertilizer, it needs warmer ground temperatures for it to release. Yes and no. Sometimes it's the ground temperature, sometimes it's the mic, it's because the microbes are more active when the temperature is warmer in the soil, so then it kind of breaks it down and then releases it. Sometimes it's the rainfall. But in September, we have warmer soil temperatures. And so we can apply the slow release in September when the temperatures are warmer and then it's gonna release it over the time um, that it needs to release it. Does that make sense to you? All right. Fertility is always a tough one. All right. I always say do it in two half rates in two directions, okay? This gives you good even coverage on your lawn. So if you wanted to put one pound out, Calibrate your spreader to half a pound and go one way and then come back and go the other way. This just helps you, if you did have a miss on one side, you cover it up when you go to the other side. Because you could have things like this. <laughs> so, this was done with the drop spreader, not a, not a rotary spreader type of thing. So the rotary spreaders, you know, are going to fling it out to about 10, 15, maybe 20 feet, depending on it. The drop spreaders are only going to drop it. This is a perfect example of if you put it in your lawn, it's going to stay in your lawn. Like it's not even going to move in your lawn. It's staying exactly where it's put. So if you do a drop spreader, you definitely have to overlap 
I like the rotary spreaders. Drop spreaders work really well, for example, like the six feet in between your sidewalk and the curb. Because it's really hard with that rotary spreader that's spreading 15, 20 feet wide to make sure you hit seven, eight feet. So these are really good to have the drop spreaders and then the larger areas, the, uh, the rotary spreaders. I like to fill up fertilizer over a tarp. Definitely do it on concrete, okay? Because you can scoop it up, sweep it up if something spills. Make sure that little hole on the bottom from that lever is shut before you fill it up. <laughs> Most common fertilizing mistake is the hole being open when you dump fertilizer in, and by the time you realize it, there's a pile of fertilizer underneath the spreader. I am guilty, I have done that. So that's why I like to do it on concrete. I like to put a tarp down because if you do it on a tarp, you can just pick it up and dump it right back into the spreader and you don't have any dirt or anything else on it. But just sweep it back up, put it on. So if you do get it on your concrete, get it back into the lawn, clean it up. All right, the question was giving the argument of the solubility of nitrogen and runoff and getting into the sea, that's a big issue. Is there concern of over fertilizing the lawns? Do we typically over fertilize our lawns? If you go with these rates, you won't over fertilize because that plant would use all that nitrogen, probably even more if you put it on there. The issue is not the lawn. Once it's in the lawn, it stays in the lawn. This is the issue. It's not cleaning up. And not only fertilizer that's on concrete, your clippings that you leave on your concrete also go down the drain that remember contains nitrous, phosphorus, and potassium. If you get it on your concrete, put it back in your lawn. Don't put leaves down the drain, don't put clippings down the drain, because those all contain nutrients. So if you get it into the lawn, then it'll stay in the lawn. Grass is what we put around fields. People put grass bands around fields to make sure that there's no fertilizer runoff in large agriculture. So it will soak it up. So get it in the lawn, it'll stay in the lawn. The question was, what about combining both cool and warm season grasses in the same lawn? That is not a crazy idea. It's been done for years and years and years and years. Actually, it's been done a long time ago. We went to mono stands, and now we're kind of shifting back towards this idea. The thing is just trying to figure out how to manage it. And so actually where I grew up, we had predominantly Bermuda grass lawns. Come November, we seeded ryegrass into it and it was green ryegrass in the wintertime. Come springtime, we'd spray and kill the ryegrass out, and then the Bermuda grass would be green through the summertime. So we've, we've done it, but it's more an intense management. That's done commonly on sports fields. Jack Fry is doing some research, right? Dr. Jack Fry is doing research right now looking at mixing fescues and zoysia grasses together so you can get the benefits of the zoysia grass and warm season grass in the summer, but then enough color through the wintertime. Not, we're saying, not saying like full-fledged, fescue, but just enough to give that grass some color throughout the winter time type of thing. That's the management. The question was, wouldn't one take over the other? other? And that's yes, that's where we're trying to figure out the best management practices for that. When the best fertility application is and, and do, you, do you let it stress too much in the summer without water and let the zoysia grass take over and then do you have any left come the fall type of thing. So question was should you allow it to go to seed in the fall so it would drop seed and then kind of reseed itself I have never seen the benefit of that actually happen the amount of seed that's going to come off that plant is going to be like seeding at 0 0.001 pounds per thousand square feet um, you're better off just buying the good variety of seed and a lot of times it's just like uh it's just like row crops so seeds aren't going to be as viable you may have one on that entire stock that's not that's not viable for it. So, then you got to let it get pretty tall for it to get to seed. And then you got to bush hog it. And now we broke the one third rule. Now we got all these weeds. So, the pros and cons, you know, go with it. All righty. Y'all ready? Watering. Talk about watering real quick, aerating real quick, seeding real quick, and then pest control. Watering. Probably the most controversial thing in turf grass. You know, if you water correctly, it doesn't take much water actually to maintain turf. We typically overwater is what it is. The idea is an inch of water per week is what you kind of want to go. Ballpark, inch of water. So in the spring, that might be an inch. 
and then wait a little bit because it's not real hot and dry. Come in the middle of the summertime, you might have to water a little bit less more frequently because we're getting 100 degree heat. And so that cool season grass just doesn't like to survive it. Springtime watering is probably most important. Does anybody run marathons or ever run a marathon? Seen a marathon. Okay. All right. You don't go out and just run a marathon. You got to train it, right? You got to train for it, and it takes time to train. You can train your grass by how you water it, just like training for a marathon. If you let it stress a little bit in the springtime, then that grass knows how to stress in the summertime. If you've never let it stress in the spring, then it's not gonna know how to stress in the summer. And it's not because it doesn't have a brain, it doesn't know it, it's just because you're managing the root system. If you give it a lot of water in the spring, it's not gonna develop pretty deep roots. But if you give it water and you let it stress, it's gonna develop deeper roots, so then it's able to survive that heat and that drought during the summertime. So, let it go for a little bit, um, and then you'll do a lot better. Soak and rotate. Has anybody ever heard of that? Deep and infrequent. All right, heard that. All right, so we want to put water on it and then wait and then put water on it again. We don't want to put a little bit of water over time, like frequently, periodically. If we do it deeply and we do it infrequently, we grow deeper roots. If we do it light and frequent, we grow shallow roots and it's not able to survive drought time. So, it's hard sometimes to get an inch of water down at one time, right? It starts running off the soil surface, okay? That's why I like to employ what's called soak and rotate, all right? You can start on one part of your lawn, and if you know that you're only getting a half an inch in, then go water another part. By that time that's done, come back to the first one and put the rest of that half an inch of water to get your toe in because then it's allowed time for it to move through the soil, and then you put the other inch of water, or a half an inch of water, so you've totaled an inch deeply, and then now you do it infrequently. If you got a sprinkler system, that's why you got different zones, you can time this zone, put a cup out there, figure out exactly how much water is getting put out, um, type of thing. So deep and infrequent. Like I said, you can let it stress in the spring, makes it more drought resistant in the summer. Um, Look for darker, hot spots, purplish tinge. You know, I was talking about dormant and dead. Purplish stress turf to dormant's pretty fine line as well. I, get to, I can see spot drought stress turf, but I look at grass every single day. That's what I do, that's my job. So really, sometimes it's easier to see than others. Look for when the leaves are just kind of starting to shrivel is the easiest. That's when it turns a little bit of purple. So, also, don't overwater. Roots need air to breathe. And so, we know in soil, you have the soil particle, water particles, and air particles. And you can fill all the air particles in the soil with water. And once you do that, you've created a swamp. And then the roots can't breathe. And then so then, your roots just stress and they'll end up dying off. We saw that this year in the springtime with all the extra, extra, extra rain. We couldn't help it. There's nothing we could do about it. But it, a lot of soils got flooded and then so the roots just kind of pruned themselves off. They couldn't get oxygen, you pull them up, they were brown, they were nasty looking. And so that just proves roots need air to breathe. So how much water do you know you're putting on your lawn? Who waters their lawn? All right, how much do you put? Okay, that's good. How about you? About an hour at a time. Hour at a time, okay. I have no idea how much water comes out of your hose an hour. You know? So, it's, I mean, it's a perfect example, because I had to do this too, okay? I don't have an irrigation system, but I have water in my lawn. And so what I do, I know that that sprinkler's set up to go 90 degrees, and in 30 minutes, I get a quarter of an inch of water. I just put a cup out there. We don't have to do a full-blown audit. If you got a system, just set a cup one night and just see how much you got on there. So that way you know if I water it for 30 minutes, I'm getting X amount of water out. Yes? Soaker hoses. Work really good. Uh, it's hard to do a lawn with a soaker hose, though. 
Um, work really good with gardens. Believe it or not, we're taking the idea of a soaker hose and putting drip irrigation in under turf. We're studying and trying to figure out how that will work. Um, K-State fans, any in here? Go to football games? All right. You're looking at the north end zone of the state, Bill Snyder Stadium. On the right side, there is a really, really nice row of trees and grass. Half of that turf grass is fed by an overhead irrigation system, and half of it's fed by a subsurface irrigation system. It's used half the amount of water on the subsurface of the head of the above, and it looks the same. So this is some new research. So we're trying the idea of soaker hoses, spacing them underground. It's just costly. It's hard to put in. You got roots of trees. It's, it's, we're working on it, though. But yeah. So biggest thing with watering, um, know how much you're putting on. I like to water in the morning time. OK? Why do we water in the morning? Chance to dry out. I heard that one. Why do we want it to, the leaves to dry out? Get funguses. Yep, we'll talk about that when we get to the disease session. What else? Why do we want to do it in the morning? Less wind. You notice I didn't put no wind. Okay, it's typically less wind in the morning, so you don't have as much drift from your sprinkler system. And less evaporation at that time. And also usually better water pressure in the morning time. Because not as many people are running dishwashers, washing machines, all that stuff that they do when they get home at night. So I'll show a couple pictures. We got turf irrigation issues here. What do you, what do you think's going on? There's a head there, there's a head there, one there, one there, one there, one there. They had just had too many heads on at one point. And so it wasn't covered. This was a great one. There's the irrigation head, green around there, brown around there, green around that. So the adjustment on the nozzle is shooting too far. It looked like he had crop circles. Aliens visited his lawn. <laughs> I mean, it was perfect round circles around everything. So check it. Just because your paper's wet in the morning doesn't mean you got good coverage on your irrigation system. You know, If you got moss growing on the side of your house, you may want to move. A sprinkler type of thing or on the side of your mailbox. Turn it on during the day, check it and see what's going on. What do we got going on here? Bad water pressure. You ready for this? This is the state of the art Kansas State University Turfgrass Research Center in Manhattan, Kansas. <laughs> okay. For the past eight years, we have been operating an entire turf uh, research facility off of 50 gallons per minute. And if you have one zone too many on, you lose pressure across the whole thing. So I had to take a picture of that. And then how about this one? Just like fertilizer, concrete does not grow faster if you water it. OK? And I think this is maybe the last one. What do we got here? It's a, I'll give you a hint. The picture is blurry for a reason. Think of, raining? Is that what you said? Yep, it's raining. No need to water when it's already watering type of thing. Get one of those smart controllers that cut it off, you know. And if you get one, don't mount it underneath the eave of your house where no water gets to it. Mount it outside on the edge. Save a lot of time. All right. I bet we can do these two in, in about five minutes. How about that? All right. Aerating. Other than mowing, I think it's the second most important thing that you can do to your lawn. Typically, our lawns are heavy, compacted clay soils. If you aerify, you can reduce thatch. You're allowing better water infiltration. You're allowing the, uh, the air to get to the roots so the roots can breathe better. You're, applying, you're supplying a home for seed to go into when you're seeding. And you're also supplying the fertilizer to the root system. It's already directly put into that hole. So aerating is indirect. It's just the act of poking holes and removing cores. So you've seen, you've seen these type of aerifiers, right? They will beat you to living death trying to run one of these things. They are not fun. 
There is no steering wheel on those. It is literally a drum filled with weight, and then you flip that switch right there, and it takes off. It's one speed, and it's full blast type of thing. They got other ones out there. That's just a walk behind one. Um, but it's just the idea of poking holes, and this one is removing cores. So it's actually removing them out of the ground. So it's reducing compaction. Some just poke holes and doesn't remove anything. If that's all you got, that's better than nothing, you know. But it's gonna that hole is gonna close in faster because you actually didn't remove anything out of it to remove that density of that soil. If you do it, go over the lawn a couple times. It's gonna leave those things all over it. It's okay. It's okay to leave those things there. It's got nutrients in that soil. It's gonna be fine. You don't have to rake them up. So, how often depends on. How compacted your soil is depends on how much traffic you're getting. I got an area in my yard, I call it the Daytona 500 that my dog takes every morning and every afternoon. It's way more compacted than the rest of the lawn. This year, that's actually the only place I aerified. Everywhere else is pretty good. I only aerified that one area. Um, if you got sandy soils, you don't have to do it as much. If you got real clay soils, y'all talked about soil texture, percentages of sand, silt, and clay. Heavy clay soils tend to compact more, and you'll need to do it more. It also is a thatch control. Does everybody know what thatch is? Okay. Thatch is that layer of stuff. Okay. Yes, this is real scientific. It's stuff. And it's in between your soil and the top of the grass, or like the crown. So what happens is turf starts growing in this thatch. This thatch is just like a sponge you use to clean dishes with. It soaks up water really fast and it dries out really fast. Soaks it up really fast, dries out really fast. Over time, wetting and drying, it stops taking in water. You ever took a sponge, put it under the water, uh, under the sink, and it just runs completely off? It's the same thing as what thatch does. It becomes hydrophobic and doesn't allow water to go from the surface to the soil. So if you aerify, you're poking a hole through that thatch. You're not removing it, but you're poking a hole through it. So you got about a half an inch is good, over and half an inch, you kinda wanna get rid of it. If you have thatch, just go over it with the tiller and try to take it up. It's very similar to what we're about to talk about next. It's called verticutting, power raking. It is the act of removing this thatch, okay? If you remove that thatch, what else is coming with it? The grass. Trying to remove that thatch is very invasive, so you must reseed right afterwards. Now, if you aerify, it's not as invasive as verticutting, which is this power raking. Has anybody ever seen one of these verticutters or power rakers? All right, this is a about an 18 inch shaft with about 10 saw blades on it that spin real fast. And so what it does, you let it down and it cuts a groove and rips up all that thatch and all that stuff. Then you have to rake it all up and then you have to reseed. So cool season lawns, you wanna do it in the fall and you gotta reseed. Do you have to reseed warm season lawns if you're to remove thatch? No, why not? Because you got rhizomes and you got stolons. Yeah, it's gonna look a little bare and barren, but there's stuff for it to come back from. So that removes the thatch from it. All right. That's not a fun job either to do. All righty. You wanna do seeding real quick and then take the break? All right, let's do it. I'm gonna try and go fast. Seed. Seed selection is the most important when it comes to seed. Not only the varieties, but look at what else is on this label. So this is an example of a seed label, all right? You got what's called other crops, inert matter, and weed seed right here. Other crops can be weeds. They just haven't designated them as weeds. They have put them in another bag and sold them as a crop type of thing. So if you have good or bad, whatever's in this other crop, say we had a half a percent of that bag, not even one, but a half of percent, you end up planting 12 to 16 seeds per square foot of something that we don't know what it is. It could be good, could be bad. Could be other fescue, could be other bluegrass, 
most of the time it's going to be a bad seed. So good seed has 0.01% or better, just get 0% other crop and 0% weed seeds. And when it comes to weed seeds, we're mainly concerned with annual bluegrass and orchard grass. And that's really important because there is no control for that in your lawn once it's in there. So the best weed control is don't put it in, don't put weeds in, then you don't have to worry about getting them out. And the same numbers go with there. A half a percent ends up being 12 to 16 weed seeds per square foot that you've planted in the lawn. So seed selection is really important. Um, we talked about fertilizing in the fall, aerating in the fall, seeding in the fall for cool season grasses. You kind of do all this at the same time. Um, you go in, the soil's warm, so you're just going to germinate faster. That's why fall's better than the spring. Spring, the soil's cold. If you put seed on it, it's going to have to warm up before you get seed to come up. And the same thing in the spring with your seed that you're planting is the same thing that the weeds are doing. They're waiting for the soil to warm up to germinate as well. So you're typically going to be fighting more weeds in the spring than you are in the fall. So definitely need good seed to soil contact. So that can be done with a verticutter or a power rake. Um, and then definitely um, you could use an air fire that helps as well too. And that reduces compaction as well. So key concepts, we've kind of talked about it, but I'm going to let you read it so then we can get to, this stuff is pretty self-explanatory. So what I'm going to do is just kind of skip it and then we'll take the break and then go to pest control.